Okay, hello everyone. Uh, here we are for our lesson on 3.5 trig functions. Uh, I really wish I would have made this video last night, but I thought I would be fine today. Uh, just uh, for your knowledge, I guess I would rather have a root canal than an extraction. I thought a uh, it couldn't be any worse than a root canal, right? Those are pretty bad. I've had several of those. Uh, but yeah, this one was, I feel beat up. Okay. So anyway, we're going to start into our inverse trig functions. Uh, look at a few properties. Look at a few examples. And then we got 11 uh, questions in WebWorks for you to take a look at to practice these, uh, this skill. So... Let me, um, let's just uh, start off here. Uh, just again to highlight where we're at. Because you don't need to see me anymore. So there we go. Um, so we are in section 3.5. We have fall break on Monday. And then Wednesday, we'll come back and take a look at section 3.7. Uh, again, some things to wrap things up, application type problems. Uh, we'll do some review, and that review is posted in, in uh, the department's uh, website, uh, Math 265. I'll also uh, copy it and post it within Canvas as well. Then we'll also have an exam review. Actually, we already got it because we did a Chapter 2 review, so it's the same review we did, but uh, we'll make sure it's all accessible. And then we'll do the exam review where we bring these two together. Uh, again, it's always an opportunity to answer a few questions. We really don't have enough time in class to go all the way through it, but we will do as much as we can to make sure uh, everyone has questions that they have answered. And uh, I had intended to do office hours this Friday, but uh, I can't even make it to campus. so. Uh, next Friday when we do the review afterwards, uh, I will have that open for uh, any questions after class. Um, if I get enough interest, we could even, uh, I could even set up another room for that. Maybe we'll do that for like a, maybe a full-fledged um, review. We'll, uh, we'll keep in touch over that, but just notice that this Friday, uh, that's uh, 10, 6, uh, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 10, 14, um, we'll do that. And then Monday, we've also got available. Okay. Uh, you might need to speed this up a little bit. My, my brain is on a slow motion mode. So, uh, so anyway, here we are. When we have a trig function, and this is a picture of the sine function, uh, before we start talking about an inverse sine, we recognize that the only way, effective way to really do that is to talk about, is to get sine to be a one-to-one -one function. And so we look at it, sine itself is not a one-to-one -one function. There's, in fact, there's these two places. Um, and as you, if you follow this line along, you'll, there's many places where it will intersect, right? So it's a, uh, each time you've got an input, there's a, an output value. So that's repeated many times. Um, and um, so uh, what we're going to do is as you can see over here we're going to reduce the domain and basically say okay where would i cut it so it comes up to here oh it's going to start repeating here so i'll just kind of cut it off here at pi over two and then if i cut it off back here at negative pi over two it all of a sudden gets this little graph that we see over here uh, we're going to see we're going to need to do a uh, similar thing with cosine, but it ends up being different. But uh, So when we talk about the inverse sine, which we'll define as inverse sine of x equals y, um, our domain goes from negative pi over 2 to pi over 2. So we relabel this. Uh, usually we call this, um, instead of negative pi over 2, it's usually called, uh, I think, what, 7 pi over 2, 4 pi over 2, that would be 
uh, 3 pi over 2. So usually we call this 3 pi over 2, right? But going backwards, we're going to call it negative pi over 2. So that's the main thing. Uh, so this you should have hopefully uh, picked up in your uh, trade class. But um, again, I see I've left a few things. So what is the inverse sine? Um, so the inverse sine is a function that when we, we take it, we get back to the angle. So it, we put in the sort of, so the idea is that whatever the sine of an angle is, that equals x. That gives us a value. Uh, when you put that x in there, that'll give you back the angle, right? So um, in this definition, y is an angle measured from negative pi over 2 to pi over 2. So thinking y is an angle and x is a, in this case, a sine value, but we're going to use it in multiple ways, but this is a, uh, a function value. And so if we look at the unit circle, uh, you know, we could define what would be the inverse sine of one half. And the way we would look that up is we look for where there's a one half. And remember, what we're looking at sort of backwards is where is sine one half? Well, here it is right here, uh, because sine is the y coordinate. So what we're going to see is that if I want the inverse sine of one half, if that's the input, the output is going to be the angle, right? Y is the angle. Uh, so this would be pi over six. Likewise, if I want to find the sine, the inverse sine, you could also call this the arc sine, which you'll see it done in there. Uh, say maybe of negative square root of three over two. I look, okay, oh, it's not negative up here, but there's a square root of 3 over 2, but that's a positive one. Oh, here it is, negative square root of 3. So it's this angle here. Now, again, we're, we're going to relabel this because um, we're going to relabel this as a negative pi over 2. So all of these, this would be, instead of 11 pi over 6, it's going to be negative pi over 6. So in a way, it's kind of easier. Negative pi over 4. And then this is just uh, negative pi over 3. So I just took it off a unit circle, and but when you're dealing with inverse functions. So we see this is the this is what they're asking, the inverse of this angle. So they're asking, what, what is its angle? So in this case, we'd say it is negative pi over 3. Uh, we could not list it as 5 pi over 3 because that is not in the domain. Uh, or it's not in the possible outputs here, right? Because y can't, can't be, I guess it's not the domain of the sine function so uh, that we had to limit it to. It wouldn't be one to one. So we've got to stay between negative pi over 2 and positive pi over 2. Okay, And then let's see some other features. Um, I guess that was it. So, so one of the things you see is that uh, when you take the inverse of sine, of x. Notice it will undo itself so we get back to x. This will happen as long as you keep your, because it's going into the sine function first. Uh, to get the proper values, you have to restrict x to being between pi over 2 and, or negative pi over 2 to pi over 2. If we do it the other way around, again, we take the function of the inverse, we get back to x, but the key part is as long as x was between negative and 1 and 1, because if it isn't, we won't be able to find it, right? So um, we're going to the inverse. The inputs have to be between negative one to one. So um, as far as inverse sign, these that I'm circling here, these would be all the possible inputs. Of course, there's other inputs in here for non-standard angles or I guess non-special angles. These are special angles. But uh, for our special angles, these would be all the inputs we would really be dealing with, right? just the y coordinates. Okay, so now let's talk about finding the derivative of the arc sine. Uh, let's see, I can't remember what's on the next. Uh, anyway, I'll, uh, I'll go from uh, scratch here and then we'll see how this all works out. So first we start off with that, right, we're looking for, uh, we're defining 
the inverse sine to have an input of x and the output will be y. And so that means that we have that this is coming from a function where sine of y equals x. That's how we're using our variables here. Okay, so to find the derivative of the inverse sine, since we, we don't know what it is, we're going to start with something we do know. And then we'll use some substitutions, uh, some trig substitutions and some even function substitutions so that we could actually come up with this is the way the trick works. So we're going to start off with sine y equals x. And I'll put my little parentheses here saying y is the input. So we're going to use implicit derivatives. So I take the derivative of sine of y. That's going to be the cosine of y. Since I took a derivative of y with respect to x, I put that marker dy dx. On the other side, I take the derivative of x. The derivative of x is 1, right, because it's got an exponent of 1. So the 1 comes down. Subtract 1 from the exponent, you got x to the 0, which is also 1. So 1 times 1 is 1. So we've got this. Uh, we're trying to get towards what would the derivative of the inverse function be. So we're going to solve for dy dx. And we're going to see that's going to help us a lot because I guess we're kind of going in circles a little bit. But what I'm saying is um, if I apply the inverse, or uh, uh, if I apply implicit derivatives here, uh, what I get is whatever the derivative of this is, right, d dx, we'll just do that, the general derivative of the inverse sine of x using implicit derivatives, derivative of y is 1 dy dx. So what we're seeing is that's why I need to find out what dy dx is, is because that's whatever it is, it is the derivative of the inverse sine. So that's why I'm, I'm doing this. So I've got dy dx, so let's solve for dy dx. Uh, divide both sides by cosine over y, right? So that's going to give us dy dx equals 1 over cosine. And I guess we could stop here and say just that's what the derivative is. But notice this is a function in terms of x. So it would be nice to know what if we could get a derivative that was in terms of x as well. And we can. Uh, what we're going to do is we're going to make a substitution. Uh, and the reason is, is because we, we got to see, OK, I got to get to somehow x. And what I do know is I know what x is. I know that sine y equals x. So if I Instead of had cosine y, if I had sine y, I could replace it with x. So uh, how can I do this? Well, there's a trig identity. Let me put it down here of cosine squared x plus sine squared x or, or y. You could, you know, but in general, I guess I should be using y's. But well, yeah, let's just change these x's to y's. Why not? There's some sort of input, so we'll call those y's. And then what you do is you, let's solve this for x, right? Subtract sine x from both sides. So here's that Pythagorean trip uh, identity. Cosine of y equals 1 minus sine squared of y. And then to finish solving, we take the square root of both sides, and we have that cosine y is equal to the square root of 1 minus sine squared y. And now we could do one more substitution here. So since we've got, we're going to put this in for cosine of y, right? Why not just do one more? What is sine of y? Sine of y is x. So remember this square is, um, since I've got room down here, it's really 1 my uh, sorry, not plus, it's 1 minus sine of y squared. 
and so we're going to use it as square root of 1 minus. What we're going to do is make that substitution. Sine of y is actually, or identically, x. So we've got x squared. So what we're going to do is replace cosine of y with this. So that's 1 over square root of 1 minus x squared. That's dy dx. That's dy dx. So what we have is when you want to take the derivative of the inverse sine, what, you, what it's equal to is 1 over square root of 1 minus x squared. So again, in application, what we do is we remember that because we don't want, to, I mean, we could re-derive re it every time, but that's a lot of work eventually just from uh, remembering it, using it, okay? Uh, we're going to see that it's similar for cosine, but again, with cosine, cosine is equal to minus sine. The only difference is, is this is going to be negative. So we'll look at that for cosine. We won't go through the whole process again, but that's how we got the uh, sine. We'll look at another uh, construction of what the inverse is um, for tangent, but because it's very similar. So using the Pythagorean identities, we are able to kind of come back and forth in these definitions. Okay, and I think there's one more down. Yeah, it's down here. Here's the formal definition in the book. And again, it defines x has could only go from negative 1 to 1. Otherwise, it's not in the 1 to 1 part. Okay, because we're, we're dealing with an inverse sine. Uh, so similar process for cosine. We'll just kind of highlight these. Um, again, we want to make it 1 to 1. Uh, where do we go? Well, we, we can't go from negative 2 to uh, uh, pi or negative pi over 2 to pi over 2 because that's not 1 to 1. So with cosine, the place we want to cut it is at 0. And then we come and one full period would be here. And then we would start, you know, so uh, we want to limit it from 0 to pi. So it's going to have a different um, domain. So it goes from 0 to pi. That's the one thing to remember is it's it's different than sine because uh, that's how we can make it uh, a one to one. We we like to include the zero, uh, but in a sense it's it's a little easier because all the uh, angle measures are positive instead of having to go with neg negative angle measures. But um, that's how it works. So what are the details for inverse sine or sorry inverse cosine, arc cosine? Um, do the same thing inverse cosine of x equals y, so that means that the cosine of y equals x. That's what it means to be an inverse. Um, and we define uh, y to be an angle between 0 and pi. And just because that's that's what will make it work. That's what makes it one to one. So in this case, when we look at the unit circle, we're using the top hemisphere. Um, and the, the input values that we can put into uh, an inverse cosine or the arc cosine, right, are these values here, the, the x-coordinates. Um, and again, we could put the other ones. Uh, there's, there's other angles, but these are sort of our special angles that we're used to using. Um, but as we put these in, we get, uh, we get values back that are angle values. And the nice thing is, is with this picture, um, if I want to find the inverse cosine of square root of uh, radical 2 over 2, negative, what I, I want to find the inverse cosine of negative square root of 2 over 2. Uh, sometimes I'm not even sure what I'm saying anymore. I look it up here, so this is, this is the, what I need, what angle goes with that? 3 pi over 4. If I needed the positive square root of 2 over 2, I would say it would be pi over 4. So we look, but uh, these are the values that we could um, be putting in. Okay. Um, let's see what else is on here. Oh, great. I wrote on the top of what I need. So let's uh, go ahead and erase it. Okay, so you can kind of see that. 
So just saying, uh, if I take the inverse cosine of the cosine, I get back to x. That is only in the case where x is between 0 and pi, because if it's not, it's uh, we, we could do a coterminal angle or something, you know, but we got to get it between 0 and pi. Whatever we do, x has to be between 0 and pi. Otherwise, it's not 1 to 1. And then also, if you take the cosine of the inverse cosine, right, you, you're undoing whatever you do, so you end up back where you start. And um, that's true as long as x started out being between negative 1 and 1 because it's getting plugged into the cosine function. So those are all important things to take a look at. Okay, let's go ahead and shrink that down. Um, when we go to get the cosine, uh, the derivative of the cosine, we find similar to what we did with the sine, it would be, the story would be very similar, except that when we took the derivative of cosine, you get negative sine, and that's where that negative comes from. So it really looks very similar to the derivative of inverse sine, except it's negative. Okay, so that's the thing you have to remember. Cosine will give us this negative. Just as you have to remember when you take the derivative of cosine, you get negative sine. When you take the derivative of sine, you get positive cosine. So it's kind of the same type of deal. Uh, but you you could go through the same steps if you wanted to. You would see the same, um, the same answer here. We're going to just kind of take it at that without going through it. Uh, but we will step through arc tangent because... The story is a little bit different, not too much, but a little. Okay, arc tangent. Um, this is the graph of arc tangent, and there's a bunch of them. You know, they keep repeating. Uh, so it does highlight that we need to keep it between negative pi over 2 and 2, because if we included these other ones, it would not be a one-to-one -one function. So we limit uh, our area, our domain, um, to that. Uh, we define the inverse tangent to be the inverse tangent of x equals y. Therefore, tangent of y equals x. So we're going to use that. And y is the angle. Remember, y is an angle. We put into the tangent. It's the answer here. And it has to be between negative pi over 2 and pi over 2. Uh, and I think um, I always have to remember what I've got written here. Let's think about how we would get the derivative that's what I need to do. No, okay, yeah, that's all I need to do. So we're going to take the, the tangent of y. That's equal to x. And just like we did last time, what we're trying to do is we're trying to find what is the derivative of the tangent, the inverse tangent of x. Uh, using, if we take the derivative of this side, implicit derivative, we get dy 1 times dy dx, right? So we'll start over here because we know if we use implicit derivatives over here, we will find out what dy dx is. And once we have dy dx, we've got the um, derivative of inverse tangent. So derivative of tangent is going to be secant squared y dy dx. derivative of x is just 1, and so we get dy dx equals 1 over secant squared of y. Now again, that's not real helpful. I mean, it is the answer to what is dy dx. It is a, an answer, but we want to get it in terms of x, and so we dig back into our trig identities and we see that secant squared the Pythagorean identities in particular is actually equal to 1 plus tangent squared of y so that is an identity um, and then what we're going to see well what is and again I'll just kind of go down here remember tangent squared y is just another way of writing 1 plus tan y squared. What is tan y? Tangent of y is x. So what we're going to see x 
squared. Okay, so that's the steps we went. So secant squared. So we're going to make this substitution. So this is 1 over 1 plus x squared. Um, and again, it seems sort of circular. We're going back and forth. But it, it's a way to get what the derivative of the inverse is in terms of, it, of something that has just an x, right? Um, that dy dx, so this is equal to 1 over 1 plus x squared. Um, but remember, we're doing trig. We, we're involved with triangles, the, that Pythagorean theorem. We're, we're involved with right triangles, for that matter. Um, so this Pythagorean theorem, uh, Pythagorean identities come out quite a bit. Okay, so, and we'll just formalize it that, yes, that's what the derivative is. And so in practice, what we start doing is when we need to take its derivative, we just, that's what it is, okay? Whatever this x is, we square it. It's 1 over 1 plus that squared. That is its derivative. So sometimes the hard part is, is it's, you know, we kind of, we went through limits, so, and we, we got a, a sort of this feeling, gut feeling about the power rule that you just bring the exponent down and multiply and subtract one, that that worked. Um, but some of these other derivatives that we're working with, e to the x, natural log of x, um, and these, even the trig functions themselves sometimes, uh, don't feel as satisfying. But to get forward, we start using them and, you know, kind of have to see, okay, yeah, it. I can follow how we got it. It doesn't really maybe feel completely satisfying, but that's what it is. Okay. So we've got these table of values. Now we're not going to go through these uh, uh, reciprocal functions, so cosecant, of, because we could rewrite this as 1 over cosine. In fact, in the homework, we're not going to have you do any of these, but um, this really does come from being the reciprocal. And here, uh, so notice uh, cosecant goes with, uh, well, anyway, since we're not going to use them, we're, we're not going to worry about it. Uh, but they're, they're there if you ever needed to use them. Okay, so I think we're at about a place now where um, we're going to summarize, but uh, actually I didn't finish the summary because what I want to do is, uh, since I'm here, uh, let's just keep them off for now. Um, I want to do some examples, and I'm going to do it in, in a Word document so I, I have a little bit more room uh, to work through these. And I'll use the draw function here. Let's see. Come on. Uh, let's go with uh, red is kind of, let's see how green works. And then, um, okay. So we've kind of done this. Uh, so just evaluate. There'll, there'll be a couple questions like this. So negative square root of 3 over 2. So if we've got cosine, we're using the top semicircle. We look for negative square root of 3 over 2. There it is. The answer is the angle that it comes from. So it's just going to be 5 pi over 6. So we can take that directly off the unit circle. Cos or say, uh, inverse sine of square root of 2. Now remember, uh, for that one, we're going to have to come up here a little bit. Um, we're using this one for and basically for sine and tangent. Uh, so we're looking for square root of 2 over 2, positive square root of 2. And we're looking, that's a y value. That's not going to let me draw on there enough. square root of 2 over 2. So, okay, now I can do it. There it is. And so our answer is pi over 4. And again, you'll have different ones. Now, tangent's a little different. Um, remember, tan the inverse tangent is, we could kind of think of it, it's going to be inverse sine over cosine. Because it's sine over cosine. So we're kind of thinking, what would give us uh, 1 over 3? Um, just using the standard one. Well, to get the square root of 3, we, we obviously need the square root of 3 over 2. But since it's in the denominator, where should that be? Should that be, um, should that be with the x or the y? So 
one way to do is, is kind of say, well, let's take this one. This one's going to, that's a pi over six, right? For this angle is one half uh, square root of three over two. So with fractions, you take the top fraction divided by the bottom fraction. So it's gonna be one half divided by square root of three over two. When you divide a fraction, you flip and multiply. So let's flip that and multiply it. So the two divided by two, oh, that is one over square root of three. But we want a negative square root of three, so it must be the same angle, but down here, right? Because this would give us the negative one half would be in the numerator. So it's gonna be this one, this is negative pi over six. So tangent's a little trickier because you have to get it as a ratio of these coordinates. And again, I would see here, okay, that's going to be negative one half divided by the x coordinate, which is here, square root of three over two. I flip it, that's two over square root of three, right? This is for pi, negative pi six. And so the twos cancel negative one over square root of three. You'll see this also, you, you could rationalize the denominator, although you don't have to. Uh, square root of three times square root of three rationalizes the denominator. So you might see this as square root of three over three. Negative square root of three over three. So it's a matter of recognizing those. Okay, so that's uh, kind of just getting some trig functions. Um, now, there is one in here that is going to ask you to uh, rewrite the expression in just in terms of x. And so I thought I'd go through a similar one. Um, so let me, um, I think we might need a little bit more room. So I'm going to turn that off. Uh, so I gotta do that, turn it off. Uh, give myself some space. And now, let's go ahead and write this out. And I, so inside here, uh, so we want the tangent of something. Uh, and when we're thinking the tangent of something, uh, so remember Sokotoa. So, ka, to, uh. so tangent's gonna be opposite over adjacent. But first we're starting inside here with a cosine, uh, an inverse cosine. So uh, what we're gonna do is, is kind of maybe put the, the triangle, the right triangle in this terms. And remember this is gonna be tangent of some y value because inverse cosine of x equals y. And what does it equal? It equals a, a, an angle value. So that's that. Um, what is cosine? If this is the angle, cosine is adjacent over hypotenuse. If we have a unit circle, the hypotenuse would be one. Uh, the adjacent, cosine's adjacent over hypotenuse would be x. And so that'd be x over one. So what would this side be? Well, this side, would be uh, Pythagorean theorem, right? It's going to be x, that's going to be 1 squared. That's the hypotenuse minus the other leg squared. So that's 1 minus x squared. Uh, but that's this side squared to get it just without being squared. You got to do that. So this is going to be the square root of 1 minus x squared. So yes, we did see this before. Uh, when we were doing derivatives. So that's kind of where it comes from. It really comes from this triangle, building the triangle. So if this is the triangle we build for inverse cosine, we're wanting tangent. It, that would give us this angle y. We don't actually have to get it, but then the tangent of this is going to be what? It's going to be opposite over adjacent. 
So opposite is square root of 1 minus x squared. Adjacent is x. That's what they're looking for. So you have to kind of go through the building of the right triangle using our Sokotoa. Okay, using our trig functions. So, and you'll, you'll probably have a slightly different one, hopefully, so you'll work on something. Uh, so now let's just start talking about derivatives. And again, let's, uh, I'll do sort of some simple ones to start off with just to remind us where we're at, um, what a derivative is, and we'll just do it with sine. Um, so, derivative of sine, we've done this, is going to be, so I guess I'll put it this way, f prime is going to be 1 over the square root of 1 minus x squared. Okay, Just sort of from memory, from using it, we don't, you, you could go ahead and derive it if you wanted to, we've already done that. So what about this one, uh, if g of x, so the derivative of g of x, we're going to use the chain rule, um, but what we get first is the derivative of inverse sine is going to be 1 over square root of 1 minus whatever's into the inverse squared, and so we've got a 2x there, right? So that's going to become 4x squared. But we also have to multiply, using the chain rule, the derivative of the inside, derivative of 2x is going to be 2. So we could write our final one 2 times 1. So we get a 2 up here. We get a square root 1 minus 4x squared. Uh, same thing, a chain rule thing here happening. So h of x. First, the derivative of the inverse sine is, is always 1 over the square root of 1 minus the input squared, so that's 7x squared, squared. And then we multiply, using the chain rule, the derivative of 7x squared. So 7x squared, that's derivative 2 times 7 is 14. Subtract 1 from the exponent, so that's 2 minus 1, that's x to the 1 power. So that's going to give us that the derivative will be 14x in the numerator, square root 1 minus uh, 7, uh, so we square this, this is going to be 49. x squared squared is going to be, you multiply the exponents, so that's going to be to the fourth. Okay, so that's pretty much that. Uh, let's go ahead and take a look at some with cosine and tangent, uh, but that are a little bit more complicated. Yeah, give a little bit of room here. Let's see how this is. And so this is going to be complicated because it's got a product rule here. Other than that, it's, it's really nothing too much more. So remember, when we've got a product rule, we take the derivative of the first one. So for g of x, let's see if we can just kind of walk this. The derivative of the first one is going to be 5 times 7. That's 35. Subtract 1 from the exponent, so that's x to the fourth. Then times the second part unchanged. This is still going to be arc, arc tan. You could write tan to the inverse 1 if you like. I think uh, the reason I do this is I think... Uh, Webert needs to have it this way. It doesn't like the negative one exponent. And nothing's been done to this thing. We have not taken its derivative, right? It has, that's, that's the, the product rule. Okay. But then we're going to do a plus, and that's where now we're going to take the derivative of the second one with the first one unchanged. So if you want to, you know, you could go, okay, let's just put the 7x to the fifth first, and then multiply times the derivative of arc tan. Well, what's the derivative of arc tan? Remember, it's going to be. 1 over 1 plus the input squared. And what's the input? 5x to the 7th. 
But that's not all of it. We remember we have to use the chain rule. So we have to take the derivative of the inside. Derivative of the inside is going to be seven times five is 35. Subtract one from the exponent, we'll get x to the sixth. Okay. And so now let's uh, clean all of this up, I guess. So the first part is really, it, it just is what it is. Uh, nothing for simplifying or algebra or anything. Part 10, 5x to the seventh. And then we're going to get plus. Now, what we can do is we can combine these two. So 7 times 35, um, 7 times 35. It's going to be 245. And what I'm doing is multiplying by 1, so I'm putting it up in this numerator. And then I've got x to the 5th times x to the 6th. So remember, we add the exponents. That's going to become x to the 11th. And the numerator is just what it is, sort of. But then we've got to square this. So 5 squared is 25. And when you take an exponent to an exponent, you multiply them. So it's 7 times 2. So that becomes x to the 14th. And that's our derivative pretty funky huh okay so product rule embedded in here and now we're going to look at a kind of a, a double chain rule right um, and this will be our last example so we've got cos inverse cosine of this but we've got an outside function so it's basically something raised to the fourth power uh, so when we go to take this derivative The outside is going to be 4 times inverse cosine 5x minus 3. Nothing's changed here. And we subtract 1 from the exponent, so 4 minus 1 is 3. That's the outside of the function. We now need to get the derivative of the inside of the function. So now we're taking the derivative of inverse cosine. Inverse cosine is 1 over square root of 1. Actually, there's a minus here, right? You have to remember that because cosine is different than sine. Cosine is the one that's negative. Um, some, whatever the input is squared. What is the input? 5x minus 3. And then, so that's the derivative of inverse cosine, but Remember, we also have a chain rule within this. We have to take the derivative of 5x minus 3, which is just going to be 5, right? Because derivative of 3, negative 3 is 0. Derivative of 5x is 5. So we multiply by 5. Just put it up in the numerator. would be fine. Actually, we can put all this up in the numerator. Um, so when we're done, we can yeah, stick all, stick this part up in the numerator times 5. So 4 times 5 gives us 20 inverse cosine 5x minus 3 cubed all over the square root of 1 minus 5x minus 3 squared. Now you could probably foil the bottom out, but it's... Uh, it's probably not going to simplify to anything of consequence, so we could just leave it like that. So here's our derivative. And I think it's, uh, it's the end of the examples. Um, I guess we can come back here to our last page, um, although I didn't do it all, but some of it. So there's 11 questions in WebWorks. Uh, this was left over from previous one so actually let me just uh, delete it um, and then just have a lovely fall break um, I'm already sort of starting to feel better I still feel like I'm beat up but uh, I got to, I'll, I'll get some work done over the, the weekend and we'll come back on Wednesday and take a look at section 3.7 thank you everyone